Hey everyone, this is Anshul Sadaria, software engineer 3 at Google. I have a question for all of you. How many of you have used dating applications like Tinder, Bumble and I don't know what all other names are there. I already feel old. Don't lie to me. I can already see your smirks behind the screens. So did you know that the initial name of Tinder was Matchbox? Obviously because of the pun match because it was meant to match different people and Matchbox because it was igniting new sparks. No, this video is not about me sharing some fun facts about dating applications, but a rather interesting system design. Yes, we are going to do a system design for dating applications. So if I use Tinder, Bumble, dating applications or dating sites, don't be confused, we are going to talk about the same thing. Before we begin, it's a humble request to all of you. If you have not seen my previous video of system design of Twitter, do check it out after you watch this complete video. This is going to be a more interesting video because we are going to do live system design. We are going to have some interesting discussions, do some design choices. So what are we waiting for? But before we jump into the video, if you want to keep learning from industry leading experts, do check out Scalar's free masterclasses on Scalar's event page. Link is in the description below. So let's get started. So what are the prerequisites that you should keep in mind before you watch this video or continue watching this video? Absolutely nothing because this video is meant for you to learn new stuff. We'll be discussing new design strategies and so on. But if you want to get the most out of this video, I would really recommend if you understand some of the computer science fundamentals. Okay, when I talk about computer science fundamentals, I mean networking, databases, DBMS and so on. You should understand what are the pros and cons of a choice of one database over the other. And you will also definitely hear some technical jargon here and there. So if you hear some technical jargon, don't worry, make sure you note it down. And I would really love if you search it over the web, even if you don't understand, don't feel scared. Ask me in the comment section, I will be very happy to resolve any doubt of yours. This video is going to be like a roller coaster, but make sure you keep your eyes open. You will feel excited, there will be some thrill and you will feel scared at some moments as well. But don't worry, as long as you have that learning attitude. Now the first step before you jump into the system design is to make sure you don't actually jump into the system design. Make sure you prepare the requirements, like what all things you should add in your system, what all features should be added to the system, and then only post the decision of requirements. Jump into the design choices, like what databases you want to use, how the data should be modeled, and so on. But this is my preference. There are two school of thoughts regarding this. One is the bottom up approach where they decide the ER model, the entity relationship model, what data will be stored, how it will, it will be stored. Then they decide how the services, what services will consume the data. On top of that, they will decide how the client or the user will interact with these services. Personally, I don't prefer this approach and this is my personal opinion. I'm repeating again. My personal preference is a top-down approach where we create the feature requirements. Then we decide what all services are required to make sure that this feature requirements are complete. On bottom of that, we will decide what data will be stored, how it will be stored, and then prepare a ER model based upon the services and what they will consume. So we are going to use a top-down approach in this system design video. And the primary reason I love this approach is because once the requirements are locked, the design decisions become a lot simpler. If you want to understand the real power of requirements, do check out my video on Twitter system design. Now, how about you tell me in the comment section what all requirements you would have decided if you were designing Tinder or any other dating application. For the sake of clarity, I am going to categorize the features or the requirements into two categories, functional requirements and non-functional ones. Now, functional requirements are the ones which actually influence the journey of a user, like how the user will interact with what all features. 
Now, let's go step by step to understand what a customer journey will look like. First of all, a customer would want to create their profile or register onto the dating site. So, uh, let's change the color. Create profile. Okay, pardon my handwriting because I know it's really bad. I have not written for a very long time. So, we will create a profile. Next, I would really want to update my profile as and when required. For example, if I got promoted, I would want to mention that thing. I would want to update my profile. So the user should be given an option to update. Okay, I'm not going to write entire update profile. So post that, uh, what all things does a user actually do? If I remember my journey when I was like exploring dating sites. So I would want to set my preferences. Yes, definitely. Like what age range am I looking for? For example, I'm 24 right now. So I might prefer people who are in the age range of 20 to 24, 25 something, I guess. And what all gender orientation I'm looking for, male, female, or any other non-binary gender orientation. So my preference would be female. And then I would have some location preferences as well. Like, do I want to connect with females in the radius of 10 miles or 50 miles or what am I looking for? So we should definitely be able to set preferences. Okay, I'm not going to write this complete again. Uh, we should be able to set preferences and further down in this video, we will understand how these preferences will actually influence the recommendation service. Okay, I'm not going to reveal a lot of details because that will be covered down the lane in the video. Now we have set the preferences, our profile is ready. What's the next part? Swipe left or swipe right. So the user should be able to swipe and post like swiping left and right, let's say you swipe right on someone and then someone swiped right on you as well, like the same person swiped right on you. So you both have matched. Okay. Now you should be allowed to chat with each other. So we should be given a possibility or a feature to chat with each other once we have matched with different people. This is what I feel should be our functional requirements. Do you think there should be more functional requirements which we should consider? Let me think about it. Oh yeah, definitely. Like we would want to upload some images, right? Because from my experience, we don't usually look at what the person has written in the profile. We usually judge the people based on their appearances, unfortunately, but that's the harsh truth. So I should, uh, this, this functional requirement should come on the top, but upload pics. Yeah, again, ignore my handwriting. So we should be given a preference to upload pics and we will decide in this video, like we will make some design uh, discussions, like what data store should we use, whether we should use a data store or not. So I think this functional requirements should be sufficient to get started with designing our uh, system of Tinder or Bumble. Let me know if you think otherwise, because I remember from my experience, there are some other cool features as well. Like uh, you should be able to super like a profile or you should be able to see the likes, like who, which profiles have liked you. And then you should be allowed to rewind the profile, like in, in case you left swipe someone and you want to rewind the profile and like them again, or even like if you want to see their profile. So that should be a possible feature. But as far as I remember, these features are available only for premium users. So we can possibly ignore it. These are not really important for us to create our MVP application, like the minimum viable product. These are not very important features. So we can now jump onto the functional requirements and lock them. Now let's jump into the non-functional requirements. First of all, what are non-functional requirements? These requirements don't necessarily influence the user's journey, but rather it affects the user experience. Let's say our system should be highly available. Like it should not happen that I'm not able to use the application for a really long time, right? Then the system should be consistent because if someone is updating their profile, I should get that information over the time. Okay, now let me know in the comments, what do you think? Should the consistency be eventual consistency or strong consistency? What does eventual consistency mean? Like after some time, the information is propagated to you ultimately. What strong consistency means is that the moment the information is updated, at the same moment, the information should be propagated to all the nodes. I really feel that strong consistency must be very harsh for an application like this. Let's say some person 
updated their profile info or uploaded new pictures. It's fine for me as a user if I'm not seeing their updated pictures at the same time. Eventually, I will get their updated profile info. So I don't think there is a requirement to push too hard for strong consistency. Let me know if you think otherwise. Then minimal latency is really important for applications like this. Minimum latency. Because it would be a really bad user experience if I'm scrolling at a profile and I'm not able to see their pictures. Or if I'm doing a left swipe and I'm not able to see the new profile really quickly. So highly available, consistent, minimum latency. What all other non-functional requirements do you think this application or dating site should support? Let me know in the comments below because I have deliberately missed out on some of them, which I will talk about in the video further. Having decided our requirements, now it's time to decide what all services will fulfill those requirements. So let's move on to that part. First of all, it should be the profile service. Okay. Now if you look on our requirements, the profile service should handle the logic for create profile, update profile, set preferences. Right. And yeah, obviously, definitely like upload pics should also be handled by our profile service. Next should be the swipe service possibly because the user should be able to swipe. Now, if you look at our requirements, the swipe functionality should, should be like made available through this service. And also the logic behind like when two person right swipe onto each other, they should match with each other. So this logic should also be handled by the swipe service. Now, if you notice one thing, we missed upon a crucial functional requirement, which was recommendation. Something happens behind the curtains, like the user doesn't see the recommendation service working, but the application, the system does work on some recommendations based on the user preferences that you had set while you are creating your profile. So recommendation service is something which works behind the screen and this should make sure that we get the profiles that we are looking for. Like the purpose of the recommendation system or the recommendation service is to show us the profiles which we are most likely to right swipe on. So that logic will be handled by this service. And lastly, the chat service, because when two people match with each other, they would want to chat with each other. For this particular service, I would really love if you have some background about networking or some communication protocols. Don't worry if you don't know, we will discuss them in detail as well. But I would really love if you do some homework before we jump onto the chat service portion. So now let's jump directly into our profile service designing. We will be having a lot of healthy discussion regarding some of the design choices that we'll make as a part of this profile service. So let's move, okay, we already designed the services. So profile service, first of all, there will be a client. I think my handwriting is improving over the time. Uh, then we will have a profile service. Okay, so the first thing that the client will want to do is to create a profile. They will pass in the username and the password. And this information will be stored in a database over here. So yeah, we can use a SQL database, we can create cache over it. Those all are the stuff that I'm not going to go deeper into because I have already explained how you can use cache and all of those stuff in one of my previous videos where I talked about the system design of Twitter. So do take a look at it to understand how we can reduce the query time and all those stuff using the caching services. So we will create the profile, uh, the profile service will be capable of doing that. Now let's say we want to update a user profile. So let's remove this part. Okay. Now let's say we want to update it. Okay. So we will pass in the user ID and the info that we want to update. Now, if you take a look at this, there is no way of authenticating. Like how do, how does the system know or how does the profile service know that the user ID whose information I want to update is my own. So we will like need to pass in the password or some sort of thing like that along with this. And here there will be some authentication system. 
which will check if like the user ID that I have passed in is actually my user ID. Now I forgot to tell you some things like if you actually use a dating application, you will see there are a lot of other authentication mechanisms like you can log in through Google, you can log in through Facebook and so on. So there are some external authentication services which you can use for two factor authentication if you have used like your OTP goes to your mobile phone and then you pass in that OTP to the application. So there will be an SMS service as well. Okay. But for the sake of clarity, I don't want to add a lot of things to this particular service because it takes away the essence of the stuff that I really want to discuss. Okay, so okay, we'll reduce the size of the eraser first of all. Yeah, uh, so we'll not dig it much deeper into the external authentication mechanisms or the SMS service. Let's keep it fluffy. Let's keep it natural. Now, a healthy practice is not to store the password directly into the databases. So instead of password, what I would prefer is to use something known as tokens. So tokens is very common in the authentication mechanisms. I'm not going to go deep into the like cryptography and all of that. So let's take away that portion away. Tokens. So the actual implementation happens through something known as JWT, which is known as JSON Web Token. Again, I'm not going to digress away from this topic by going deep into what JWT actually means. So we are going to use tokens for the authentication purpose. Now let's assume there is some other service. Let's say there is chat service. Chat service wants to know if you are the user ID who wants to communicate with their match. So they will want to interact with the profile service because the authentication module or the authentication mechanism is a part of the profile service. Let's say chat service is fine. Let's say we add a few more services as well. We don't want to repeat the logic. We don't want to interact. Like we don't want all of these services to interact with the profile service. That takes away the entire essence of microservices because microservices are meant to handle a particular logic. If all the services are interacting with the profile service, it's not a good design system. So we will modify the architecture a little bit. Let's keep a profile service over here. And in front of the profile service, we will have something known as a routing mechanism or as some people love to call it gateway service. Okay. So the gateway service will handle the request coming from the client and then route it to a particular service. It can be profile service, chat service, swipe service, recommendation service or anything. Okay. This is a very neat design. You know why? Uh, let me know in the comments. But otherwise, I think it's a very neat design because it abstracts or encapsulates all of the services. The client doesn't need to interact with individual services. The client just needs to interact with the gateway and no other service will interact with the client. Only the communication will happen between the client and the gateway service. That's the beauty of it. So this gateway will be responsible for communicating with different services. Now, having designed the high level infrastructure or the system design of profile service, let's take a look at how we are going to model the data. We are going to design the SQL table for the user. For that, we will have user ID as the primary key. We will store age, preference, location, and other details related to the user. Now, the important question which I want to ask all of the viewers is, where should we store the images? Because if you remember, the profile service handles the logic of uploading image or updating image and so on. So how should we store the images? Should we store it in the same table? Like should we store image one, image two and so on? Or perhaps we can create a more normalized version of the table, like we can create a new partition, a new table, which will store images, we will have user ID, we will have image ID, and we will have the image over here. And instead of storing, instead of storing the image in this user table, we can have an image table, where we will store the image ID instead of the entire image in the user table. I think the later one is a more flexible opinion. It keeps the user table a bit lighter, but one 
issue that can come up with this design is that it might require multiple lookups. Like for example, if a user wants to see the profile image of a particular user, we will need multiple lookups. We will query the user table, then the user table will query the image table and then return the image. It can be a little heavy, it can be very expensive operation. So we will decide how we can work upon this particular question of where to store the images. Should we store in the same data store or we can store it in the form of a distributed file system and so on. Don't worry if you don't understand the technical jargon. We will discuss the pros and cons of each of these approaches and then we will make a call what system we are going to use for our dating application. Now the question that was really important which I wanted to emphasize on how are we going to store the images. Now we considered two approaches in the previous slide storing it in the same data store. It will be in the form of blobs. Now to those who don't understand what blob is, it stands for binary large object. It's just zeros and ones like the image is stored in the form of binary large object, which is zeros and ones. In the same data store, we have two choices. Either we can store the entire image, all the five images in the same user table, or we can store it in the different image table and then create a reference in the user table for that. Another option is file system. Now, before we take a call of our preference between both of them, it's important to understand the pros and cons of each of these choices. Now, let's see what does the data store have to offer us. The first thing is transactions. These are the atomicity, like the database provides us the atomic structure, all the transactions happen in one go together. Then it's the mutability. It allows us to update the images, delete the images, update a part of image and so on. Do we actually require this? We are going to discuss this further. Then it provides us an opportunity to index. This is usually used for search operations. We are not going to search over the images. So this particular offering may also not be required for us to store the images. And the last one, which is very important one, which I want to highlight is security or the access controls. Like the same security offering which is provided to the user data, the same offering is provided to the images as well, which is a pro of storing it in the data store, same data store. Now, as we discussed, we don't need the indexing offering because we are not going to search on a portion of an image or we are not even going to search on the basis of image. We are going to search possibly based on the age range or any of the user preferences that we have set. So index, indexes are not actually required to store the images. Mutability is important because we are going to update the images, but we can do one thing like we can create a new image, we can create a new file and then delete the old one. So in this way, we don't actually use the mutability feature of the data store. We are not going to update some part of the image. So that is also not required. Now transactions, atomicity is also not required because we can update the image or delete the image asynchronously. It doesn't need to happen in a single transaction. So we can get rid of this as well. Security is important, but we will see how we can manage security in our file system as well if such a possibility arises. Here we discuss the pros of using a data store. Now let's talk about some of the cons which might influence our design choice. So the first con is that multiple lookups which we already discussed before. So this can be actually an expensive operation like if we are going to query the images from the data store and send it to the client from a SQL database. So this is going to be very expensive which is a very important con which we need to consider while making our design choice. The second con is disk IOs take a lot of time. Okay. The image, if the image is very large, it's going to be stored into multiple blocks within the disk. Those who don't understand what I just said, take a course on the databases or database management systems, which will help you understand how the image is stored into blocks, which are a part of a disk system. So when you query 
multiple disk. If your image is stored in multiple disks, you need to query different blocks from the disk. And querying different blocks from the disk is a very expensive operation. If you remember, disk IOs are really expensive. We cannot afford multiple disk IOs for the lookup operation. So this is part of multiple lookups only and this will also influence our design choice. Now the next thing to remember is a data store cre creates some replicas. When you create a replica, let's say you are storing image. A user has five images and let's say each of them cost two MB tours. Now let's say there are millions of users. Can you calculate for me and tell me how much space will be utilized to create a replica and just imagine how much time will it take to create such a big replica. Replicas are also costly. Let me know in the comment section after you perform the calculation. 2 MB image, 5 images and million users. Okay, here we are talking about the active users. There can be more than million users. So all of these cons really influence our design choice. Now let's take a look at some of the pros which are offered to us by the file system. We can create a CDN. Okay, I will explain what CDN means. But let's say we have a distributed file system. We can create a CDN on top of it. This is known as content delivery network, which helps us to cache the images if a user is going to query them multiple times. So this actually makes the lookups much faster as compared to data stores, where caching the images will also be very costly because we are storing the images in the data store. We are also storing them in the caches. So it's really expensive for us. As a part of DFS, we are going to store them as in the form of file system. We will store the file URLs along with the user info Let's see how it looks in our data store. We will have user ID. We will have image ID. Image ID and then we will store the file URL. Now this image ID will be stored in our user table and from that we will reference the images. So if you want to delete an image or update an image, create a new file and then delete the old file. Yes, it may create some issues of dangling images wherein we are not actually referencing a deleted image and we forgot to delete that image. So we really need to make sure that our mechanisms are in place so that all of the advantages of a data store are actually fulfilled by our file system. Yes, it can be a little bit tedious but it is still manageable. So I think a distributed file system is the right choice for us to store the images and let's see how our ultimate profile service will look like. Now I really believe that we can create a new service, we can spawn a new service to handle all the image operations because if we store all of these operations inside the profile service it will be very costly. Let's say there is a new possibility where we can use the images in our machine learning model to let's say calculate the beauty of a picture or something. Some way to recommend a better suggestion, better profile to the user, then we will require to query the images. So for this we can create a new service. Again, there is no hard yes or no, it's my personal preference. We can create a new service, which is the image service and let this handle all the image related operations. So there will be a distributed file system over here, which will, it will interact with and then we'll create a database where it will store the file URL, image ID and the user ID and this will be referenced. Whenever someone wants to query the images, the gateway service will reference from the image service instead of the profile service. So it may require two calls to the profile service and the image service, but I think decoupling them is a healthier option as compared to merging everything 
in the profile service. Let me know if you think otherwise, we can have a healthy discussion in the comment section. Now we have completed the design of our profile service. We took some rational calls, we made our own personal decisions. It can be right or wrong, it's very subjective. Now let's move to swipe service. So when a user swipes left or right, this swipe service will handle the logic. If you're going to match with a person or not, this service should handle that logic. Now this is a client. Do you think we should store the swipe information with the client itself rather than storing it in the server? Can you let me know what are the cons of this approach? The first con which I can imagine is if I'm storing all of the likes and dislikes with the client, I have no way to identify on my own as a client if I matched with a person or not. I should be communicating with the server to let the server know that okay, this is my right swipe. Can you let me know if the opposite person has also right swiped me or not? So ultimately the server should be the source of truth rather than me making the decisions on the client side. So I think it's a very healthy practice to store that information in the server itself. Let's complete this design. This is our gateway service. This is our swipe service. Now, what will be the ER model? What information are we actually going to store in the data store as a part of the swipe service? There can be multiple options. None of them are right or wrong. It's just some decisions that we take based upon the requirements. So what I have decided or what I am thinking right now, another issue which I think can come up if we are storing the swipes left and right with the client side is that let's say I uninstall my application. I am going to lose all of my swipes. And with that, I also lost all of my matches. For some reason in the future, if I come back on the application again, there is no way for me to connect with my matches. This can be a really very bad experience for me. So I actually want to store the match information in the data store itself. Let's take a look how we will design our data store. We can keep the information of user IDs user ID 1, user ID 2, and then we can actually check if 1 liked, 2 liked, and so on. Don't actually name your variables in this way. This is just for the purpose of the video. So make sure that you follow the proper nomenclature whenever you are preparing your ER model. What will happen is when 1 likes the profile of 2, here, one liked shows true, okay? Now when two also likes one, it means two liked also becomes true. This is a way for us to ensure that, okay, one and two have matched with each other if both of them have the value true. If one of them have the value false, then it means that one of them have liked but the other one has not liked. Now with this ER model, do you think we are actually storing the information of our left swipes? If two users, both of them have left swiped onto each other, do you think we are going to store that information in our ER model? I think we are losing the left swipes. And I don't think it's a very crucial information that we are losing on. Because if I'm left swiping a profile and I get the same profile again, and let's say I change my mind for some reason, I should be allowed to have another opportunity or even multiple opportunities in that case to match with that person or at least right swipe the other profile. So this service will be responsible to let us know if a user one has matched with a user two or not. This service is going to be consumed by a lot of other service. Can you let me know in the comment section which all services will be consuming this service? If you are looking to chat with your match after you have matched with a person, this service, the chat service, will want to know whether you have matched with user 2 or not, in case you are trying to chat with user 2. You are user 1 in this case. So the chat service will interact with the swipe service to get the information about the match. Now let's say you want to look at the profile of the user 2 who you have matched with. So the profile service will want to know if you are actually allowed to see the profile of user 2 or not. 
So the profile service will also interact with the match service and the match service will return a true or false in a boolean way to let the profile service know that hey it's okay for user 1 to see the profile information of user 2. You may just want to look at the likes and dislikes of the person, the interests of the person or just randomly stalk the profile of your match. Now we have already designed two of the service out of the four, profile service and the swipe service. Which service should we design next? My heart really says recommendation system, but I think it's really complicated to explain it at this moment. So we will keep it for the later and go on to the chat service. Now let's say you are user one, you match with a user two and you want to chat with that user. We also have a user two. How will both of them communicate with each other? We have gateway over here. User one would be like, hey gateway, can you send message to user two? Gateway would be like, how do I know if you have actually matched with user two? Remember the swipe service, which we just recently designed? Yes, the gateway can directly communicate with the swipe service and then forward the message to user two. Do you think it actually works in this way? I feel that we should decouple the logic of gateway actually taking the decision whether the message should be sent to user two or not. So for that purpose, let us create a new service which will handle all of that logic. So instead of gateway actually communicating with the swipe service, we will let gateway communicate with the chat service and rely on the chat service to ask the swipe service if user two and user one have actually matched with each other or not. Once the swipe service says that, hey, like user one has matched with user two, allow it to send the message to user two. But an important thing to remember here, and I really hope you didn't bunk your networking classes because we are going to talk about some of the communication protocols. Okay, let me ask you a quick question. What is HTTP? I'm not asking you for the full form because you obviously know that hypertext transfer protocol. But what I mean to say is that it's a client server communication protocol where the client sends the request to the server and the server doesn't ask the client that, hey client, do you want to ask me anything? The server just sends the response to the client. So in this case, do you think that the gateway will actually query the user to saying that, hey, this is the message that you have got from user one. That's not what HTTP does. Here we have a different protocol, which is known as XMPP. So obviously we are not going to send the message to user two directly. We are going to communicate through the XMPP protocol, which is the peer to peer communication protocol. Here there are no differences between client and server. All of them are equal. There is no discrimination between the client or the server. So with this peer to peer protocol, the gateway can actually send the message to the user too. Otherwise, imagine what would have happened. Like if we were communicating over HTTP, user two would be like, hey, did anyone send me a message? Just like I keep checking my mobile phone every five seconds to see if I have got the message from the one or not. So this is not actually like, this is very expensive. So user two is not going to poll the gateway saying, please check if you have got any message for me. Instead, we will use XMPP protocol, which will directly send the message to user two. But an important piece of information over here is that the user two will be listening to the gateway through something known as web sockets. Okay. User one will also be listening through web sockets. If you don't understand what are web sockets, let's keep it simple. Let's say there is a TCP connection between the users and the gateway. Okay. All of the users have some way of communicating with the gateway and it is persistent since we are using a TCP protocol. Or you can create your own protocol as well if you're interested in it. But for the sake of simplicity, let's stick to TCP protocol. All the users will be listening through this TCP protocol. And what the user one has to do is to identify what connection the user two is listening on. So this is where the real beauty of chat service comes into play. The chat service will hold the information 
about the connections of each of the user, like what connection the user is listening to. So let's say our user, our user two is listening to C2 and our user one is listening to C1. So we will hold all of that information in our data store, which will have user ID and connection ID. So what the user one has to do is to identify the connection ID of the user two to which it wants to send the message, but it definitely can't do that. So that will be the task of the chat service. Chat service will get the user ID of user two and it will query swipe service to let them know that whether the user one has matched with user two or not. Once they get a positive response that okay, user one and user two have matched, it will query the database to identify the connection ID and then transfer the message to user two through the connection ID to which it is listening. So this is the entire flow of the chat service. User one will send the message to user two using the user ID, which the chat service will query from the swipe service to identify if they matched or not. Once it realizes that, okay, they both have matched, it will query the database to get the connection ID to which user two is listening and then send the message or queue the message to the connection to which user two is listening and then the user two can keep pulling from the connection to which it is listening. This is all about the chat service design. Now let's move to the most crucial part, which I want to emphasize from a really long time, which is the beauty of dating applications. It's the recommendation service. Now let's move on to the recommendation service. Recommendation service can also be called search service because in front of the screens when you are doing right swipe and left swipe, what the system actually does is that it searches for the profiles in its data store, which you are most likely to right swipe on. So we can also call it search service if we want to. It's also shorter to write. The search logic is actually influenced by the user preferences. If you remember, when you created the profile, you added some user preferences, age, gender orientation, location, and so on. So all of these user preferences are going to influence our search service or the recommendation model in some way. There are two categories in which we can distribute our preferences, hard preferences and soft preferences. What do I mean by hard preferences is that let's say I have set a constraint of age preference to be 20 to 24. So I really don't want to see any profile outside this age range. Okay. It's going to be really bad user experience. If I see a profile of age 26 or 18 or so on, because that's what I'm not looking for. So age is a hard preference. Location is definitely a hard preference because let's say I have set a location preference to be 10 kilometers because of some reason, because petrol is costlier now, I don't know, but I have set up some preference based on the location. So I really don't want to see any profile outside of my location preference. So location is another hard preference. And lastly, gender orientation. Let's say I have set a gender orientation for female. Just imagine my user experience. If I was shown a male profile, it's not healthy and I would definitely want to uninstall the application at that particular moment. So I think these are the hard preferences, age, location, gender orientation, and so on. I don't think there are any other hard preferences. Talking about the soft preferences, which don't actually influence what profile should be shown, but rather how they should be ranked. For example, what my interests are. Let's say I'm interested in tracking. So I don't mind if someone doesn't have that particular interest, but definitely if someone has an interest in tracking, that profile should be shown on top of the other profiles. What are my hobbies? What are my interests? What is my career path right now? Let's say I'm a software engineer. So I don't really mind looking at the profiles of people who are not software engineers, but if they are a software engineer, then it can really influence our recommendation model. So there are a lot of other soft preferences will not go into detail in each one of them. But the important thing to remember for the recommendation model is that hard preferences filter which profiles should not be shown at all. And the soft preferences are responsible for the ranking of the profiles that are shown to you. So how are we actually going to use this hard preferences 
to filter the profiles that should definitely not be shown to us. One of the ways is that I can query a SQL database and there I can put where conditions, where gender orientation equal to female, where age equal to 22 or 23 or 24 and so on. But this will be very expensive. For example, imagine for the location. You will need to compute the distance between your location and the location of the other user and then take a call if that profile should be shown to you or not. So this is not a good practice. Another way in which you can do this is through indexes. You can create index on each of these hard preferences, age, location, gender, and so on. But one thing which people forget is that when you have multiple indexes, the query is optimized only for one of them. Let's say you have created an index on age. So using the hierarchical structure of a tree, you will filter out all the profiles which are out of your age range preference. But what about location and gender? Once you have got those profiles, you really need to perform those calculations on your own to extract the profiles matching your gender orientation and your location preferences. So this is again a costly operation because your query optimizer, you can tell your query optimizer that, hey, optimize for this particular hard preferences for this particular dimensions. And it is up to your database to decide which index it should actually search for. So that is a little bit out of your control. You cannot, it's not flexible enough for a developer to decide which index the search will actually be performed on. To get rid of this issue, we can use a distributed NoSQL database, something like Cassandra or DynamoDB by AWS or something like that. Now let's say I'm not very comfortable using a distributed file system, a distributed database, or possibly I have a preference orientation, I'm more comfortable towards a SQL database, then we have an alternative for that as well. We can use a SQL approach with a concept known as geo sharding, sharding based on locations. Now let's take a stop to understand what sharding actually means. So what does sharding mean? Sharding means that we distribute the data based on the values in a column. Let's say we have a column named username. So we will distribute the values from, for example, A to M, then what comes after M? N, okay, N to S, and then T to Z. So let's say we have partitioned our database into this three different shards. So all of these three different shards will have one node which will respond to it. Let's say this is node one, this responds to node two, and this responds to node three. For example, let's say someone is searching for Anshul. So they only need to identify which shard they should be calling. They will be calling node one, and hence our data store will be divided in such a way that all the user profiles having their names in the range a to M will respond to node one. All the names which are in the range of N to S will respond to node two. And all the names which are in the range T to Z will respond to node three. So this is one way of sharding where we used username to shard our data. But what happens if node one crashes? Will we stop responding the user profiles which are in the range A to M? This will be a horrible user experience because I don't want someone to search me and not return my profile. We can use a concept known as master-slave architecture, wherein along with node one, which is the master-slave, we can have a slave node, which is node two. So whenever node one, which is the master node, crashes, we can use the slave node to respond to the queries for the username in A to M. Now you will ask, what if the slave node also crashes? Okay, this is a question for you all. Let me know the probability where both the master node and the slave node crash at the same time. It's really, really low. And there is no anticipation of such an opportunity. So we will use a master slave architecture and geo shard our data. Now let me explain what geo sharding would actually mean. Let's say this is the map of some location and we will divide the entire map into grids. Now, each one of this chunk, 
okay all of this chunk correspond to a particular node let's say you are located in this particular chunk so what you actually need to do when you are performing a search operation is that you want to return the profiles within your location preference so you would be searching within this particular node and all of these adjacent nodes now the size of each of these grids will actually vary upon what is the maximum location preference which is given by the dating application or which is given by the system let's say you are allowed to add a location preference of 50 kilometers for example i think the grid size of 1 km by 1 km is very helpful in that sense you can perform a breadth first search kind of a search operation where you move from adjacent node to the next adjacent node and identify if they actually fall into the location preference which you have added now when those profiles are returned to you you can perform a filter based upon the age preference and the gender preference location preference is a trickier option to calculate and that is the reason we are doing geo sharding and not age sharding or gender sharding or something like that now let us consider some other use case let us consider the geo shards for india and us what will be the activity of those geo shards let's say this is the graph for india and this is the graph of us now this is the time axis and this is the activity axis so during the day time or during a particular time okay let me mark them as well india and us so when the geo shards of india have very high traffic the geo shards of us will have relatively low traffic and vice versa when the geo shards in us will be at their peak the geo shards in india will be at their lowest traffic so now what we can do is that we can create same geo shards we can use the same geo shards for both india and us so that we have proper resource utilization and at no point in time does our resources remain unutilized but now one problem will arise because of the same geo shards for example in european union you are not allowed to store the data of a user outside european union or eu so this will create some sort of issues if we are going to use the same geo shards for different continents particularly eu experimentally it has been found that if we randomly distribute the geo shards across different geographical locations it gives a decent enough response rate and the resources are properly utilized but for some special cases like eu we cannot perform this random distribution of geo shards now another use case is coming to my mind where we can still optimize let's create the grids again now let's say all of these grids don't have the same number of users for example this grid has 10 users this grid has similar number of users but when we come to this chunk it has less number of users for example let me just fill up something okay so what we can do is that we can actually merge all of these chunks into a single chunk and then dynamically geo shard based upon the number of users in that particular grid so that all the grids have similar number of users now you will ask me what if it exceeds our location preference but remember irrespective of the size of the grid they are holding similar number of users so even if you query a bigger chunk it is going to have around 10 users for example and then among those 10 users you can perform the location calculation on your own identify the distance and filter based upon the distance and the location preference that you have set this concept is actually in terms of computer science uh, technical jargon it is actually called quad tree i am not going to go deep into what quad tree actually means you can check it out search it over the web and let me know what quad tree actually means and how you can use that data structure to optimize the dynamic geo sharding feature that we discussed about now these are some of the random optimizations which just floated into my mind 
let me know if you have some other optimizations or how you can optimize my optimizations as well. What data structures you can use, what algorithm can be used to tweak and optimize it further. Let's take a look at what the ER model for the recommendation service look like. We will obviously be storing the user ID and we will be storing the grid ID as well. Now, based on this grid ID, we will identify the adjacent grid IDs, perform a search over that, filter based upon the age and gender orientation, and then use some ranking models to integrate it with our interest, our hobbies, my career position, and so on. And then return those profiles to the user. Let me, I don't think I really need to draw the diagram of the recommendation service, because this is the database that we are going to use with it. Let me just summarize it, how our entire Tinder or let's say dating application system architecture look like. We have a client. We already talked that the client will communicate only with the gateway service. Now there are different services which our gateway service communicate with. Chat. Profile, search, I'm not going to type, uh, sorry, I'm not going to write recommendation completely. And the last one being the swipe service. I'm not going to draw all the ER diagrams and all of them. Complete this diagram as an assignment, how each of these services will interact with each other. For example, if you remember, I talked about chat service interacting with the profile service, or the search service interacting with the profile service and so on. Okay, oops. I revealed one interaction which I didn't mention and I was expecting you to answer that. It's okay. Let me know what the complete system architecture look like. How will each of these services interact with each other? And if you have any doubt, do let me know in the comment section and I will be happy to assist you. In the hood, behind the hood in Tinder, it actually uses elastic search based upon the Lucene indices for each of these hard preferences. I'm not going to go deep into what elastic search is, what Lucene indices are, and how actually Tinder performs the recommendation system and the entire system architecture. So we all definitely know that Tinder was not developed in 40, 45 minutes. The real motivation for me for this video was to make sure that you are aware about some of the important computer science fundamentals which are really used in system design. We talked about some communication protocols through networking. We talked about how we can store images, either as blobs or in file system. We also talked about some concepts like geo sharding and so on. I know all of this technical jargon can scare you. Make sure you do some self study. And if you still have some doubts, put it in the comment section below. I really hope this content was very informational for all of you. If you loved this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Scaler's YouTube channel and make sure you hit the bell icon so that you never miss on such amazing content in the future.